so far in our study of the book of Romans, this clearest gospel of all according to Luther, we have already dealt now with chapter 1 of Romans right up to chapter 6. Now we turn our attention to chapter 7, a very complicated passage. In fact, verses 12 to the end of Romans 7 has caused a tremendous controversy throughout the history of the Christian church. Because you see in chapter 7, 14 to 24, Paul is using the personal pronoun I 21 times. And the question is raised because he says, I hate sin, I delight in the law of God, I choose to do the right thing, but I'm failing. And so the big question is, is Paul talking about his pre-converted experience or post-converted experience? And we have top historians, top theologians, C.D. Dodd and, you know, uh, Moffat and others, wise, say that this is Paul before conversion. And Luther, Calvin, John Stott say it is Paul after conversion. The question we have to ask about Romans 7 is this. What exactly is Paul trying to get across? So what we're going to do now is look at Romans 7 exegetically. That means we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the people to whom Paul wrote this letter. Because you see, Paul was not writing to you and to me. He was writing to a specific group of people with specific needs. And we have to put ourselves into their shoes. We need to understand the historical background. We need to understand their culture. That is what exegesis is, drawing out of the passage what Paul had in mind. And then we can apply it to ourselves and look at the significance of Romans 7 to us living in the 21st century. Okay, with this in mind, let's look at Romans 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, and then in brackets, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion, authority, over a man as long as he lives. Now, there are two things Paul says here. First of all, he says, I speak, I'm using, I'm, this chapter 7, I'm addressing to those who know the law. Now, what did Paul mean by that? You see, the church of Rome was made up of two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Now, which of those two groups knew the law? It was the Jews. So he's addressing this chapter 7, to the Jews who knew the law because there's a problem they were having. Now, remember, to these Jews, the word law is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Pentateuch. They knew the law inside out. The second thing he says in verse 1 is that the law has dominion or authority over a man as long as he lives. Now, this is true of any law. Let's take the law of the IRS. As long as you are an American and working, you are under the IRS law. I thought that when you were overseas, it didn't apply to you. So when I was a missionary in Africa and I came back, I was told that they would find, the IRS told me that they would find me 6% for the five years that I had not sent in the 1040 form. I said, I was in Africa. They said, it doesn't matter. Even you're at the North Pole or the South Pole or anywhere in the world, as long as you're American, you're required to send the 1040 every year. And my, I, I got scared. 6%? And they looked at my earnings and they discovered that my earnings during those six years was below maintenance. That is, my income tax was zero. And I told them, I'll be happy to pay you 6% of that. The law has dominion. It, and God's law has dominion over us as long as we're living. The moment we die, the law of God no longer is over us. We are no longer under that law. Now, having said that, he explains verse 1 by an illustration in verse 2 and 3. Now, I want you to be clear because people have confused verse 2 and 3. Let me read it first. For the woman who has a husband, is bound by the law to a husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. 
But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Paul is not discussing marriage here. That would be taking the passage out of context. He is using this verse 2 and 3 as an illustration to explain what he said in verse 1. That the law has dominion over you as long as you are living. Now remember, the law to these Jews, and these Jews were from Asia Minor. Most of them, they were from the area of Asia Minor where Paul himself had done his missionary journeys. And these Jews of Asia Minor were against Paul. And you need to know that. You, know, you need to know the historical background. Let me prove to you what they were against Paul. Why they were against Paul. Keep your finger, if you have using the Bible, to Romans 7. And please turn to Acts. The book of Acts. Chapter 21. The book of Acts. Chapter 21. And I want you to notice what happened there in verse 17 and 18. And, sorry, I meant verse 27 and 28, not 18, 18, 27 and 28. Paul had returned from his missionary journey. He's now in Jerusalem. He reports to the brethren, and that's what 718 is all about, onwards, how God had blessed him. And then James came up to him and said, you know, James, James said to Paul, you know, there are, Jews here from Asia Minor, where you have been preaching. And they are against you. So they, they believe that you are against their own, your own people. They believe that you are against the law of God. And they believe that you have desecrated the temple by bringing in Gentiles. So Paul, James says to him, please go through the purifying process so that the people know that you are not that what they accuse you is not true. And Paul agrees. He, went, he goes to the purifying process for these seven days. And now in chapter 21 of Acts verse 27, the seven days are about over. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, the same kind of Jews that were in Roman church, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel! Help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, that is, the Jews, against the law and this place. And furthermore, he has brought in Greeks, the Gentiles, into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Three accusations. All of them were lies. Let's look at each one of them. He was against his own people. Please turn to Romans Chapter 9. I want you to notice something that is incredible. Romans chapter 9. And listen to what Paul writes here. Unbelievable. But he is now reflecting the love of Jesus Christ. Verse 1 of chapter 9 of Romans. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. What I'm telling you is unbelievable, but my conscience is clear before the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 and 3, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Do you know what Paul is saying here? I am willing to say goodbye to heaven, to goodbye to life forever, to be cursed if that would save the Jews, my people. How can they accuse him of being against his people? How many of us are willing to give up heaven for our enemies? In fact, how many of us are willing to give up heaven for our friends? Here is Paul reflecting the, un the unconditional, the self-emptying love of God. Number two, he's against the law. The Jews made a mistake about the law that many Christians make today. They fail to see the distinction between the law as a means of salvation and the law as a standard of Christian living. What Paul condemned 
in all his ministry was not the law as a standard of Christian living, but as a means of salvation. He made it clear in Romans 3.20, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In Galatians 2.16, he says, by the works of the law, no one will make it to heaven in God's sight. No one will be justified in God's sight. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, please remember, folks, there was no Greek word in Paul's day equivalent to our English word legalism. So whenever you come across the phrase works of the law or deeds of the law in Paul's writing, he's referring to people who are keeping the law or trying to keep it in order to be saved or in order to contribute towards their salvation. But Paul will uphold the law as a standard of Christian living. And let me prove that to you. In Romans 13, I can give many passages, but this is a clear one. Romans 13, where he talks about Christian living. He makes this statement in verse 8 to 10. Romans 13, verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. That is the spirit of the law that God wants us from us. Then in verse 9 he says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses, you shall not cover. These are the commandments, the last six of the ten, that point to our relationship to each other. And then he, and then he ends up by saying, are all, all these commandments are all summed up in this one saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 10, Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So is Paul against the law? No. He's against those who use the law as a method or as a means of salvation. Keep that in mind, because we need to keep that in mind. What about this desecrating the temple by bringing Gentiles? The Jews also failed. They failed to understand what Christ did at the cross. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, Paul brings this truth out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Listen to what Paul penned here. But now in Christ, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, that is Christ himself, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. What is Paul talking about here? Okay, let me explain to you. In the days of Christ, in the days of Paul, there was a barrier in the courtyard of the temple. And on the barrier was a sign. And today, archaeology has discovered the sign. And that is, this is what, I'm going to paraphrase it, because I don't remember the exact words, but I'll paraphrase exactly what it says. Any foreigner, that is Gentile, who goes beyond this barrier will have to b b blame himself for his ensuing death. In other words, only Jews were allowed to go beyond that barrier. Even when a Gentile became a Jew by religion, he had, could not go beyond that barrier. And Christ, Paul is saying, that barrier that separated the Jews from the Gentiles was removed by Jesus Christ, so that both Jews and Gentiles have become one in Christ. That is part of the good news of the gospel. The Jews had failed to see this. So they were accusing him of defiling the temple because he brought Gentiles. No, the temple was not defiled because the barrier between a holy God and sinful man, the barrier between Jews and Gentiles was removed. We are all one in Christ. And that is something we Christians should also apply. You know, when I went to Washington, D.C. to pastor there, there were two churches that were dying and the conference was trying to unite them. One was a black church and one was a white church. And so because the conference could not afford two pastors for two churches, they decided to unite those two churches and all hell broke out. So much so that the pastor resigned and they called me to try and solve the problem because the blacks were yelling at the whites saying, you'd never speak you're like dummies. And the white was saying, you sing so loud, you shout amen. Two different cultures. 
And when I arrived, both sides said to me, which side are you going to take? And I said, neither. I'm going to take the side of Jesus Christ. There is no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, no black, no white in Christ. We are one. But do you know, it took me three solid years of gospel preaching to unite that church. Those first three years were hell. But once we were united, there was no longer a brotherhood or capital member. We were one in Christ. And when we had a prayer breakfast at the annual council, inviting the embassies of Washington, D.C., of all countries, to witness the power of the gospel in our church, they were amazed to see 45 nationalities living in love and in friendship. My dear people, that is the power of the gospel. But now let's go to Romans 7. These, Asians, these Jews of Asia Minor were expelled from Rome by Emperor Claudius. And then Emperor Nero allowed them to come back. So now they are in Rome. And they are against Paul. Or these three things. So in Romans 7, Paul is trying to explain that as Christians, we are not under the law. Because if you are under the law, the law will condemn you to death until you die. So this illustration in verse 2 and 3 of Romans 7 is not discussing marriage, but he's using the marriage law to explain verse 1. Now what is the marriage law? After Adam sinned, do you remember what God said to Eve? Your desire will be to your husband and he shall rule over you. Just as the law rules over us, your husband will rule over you. So there is a similarity here. Now I want to make it clear, that is not God's plan. God's plan was that both husband and wife should become one flesh. But sin is what brought this problem. Your desire will be to your husband and he will rule over you. And this is exactly what has happened. All over the world, men are trying to rule their wives. Then in the 17th century, the wives, the women of the developed countries got sick and tired. And so they formed the women's liberation. But that has not solved the problem. Now we have wife beating, wife being mistreated because the husband will not give up his authority. You know, when I was pastoring in Idaho, there was a husband and wife in a, in a bar. They got into a fight and the wife grabbed the keys of the car, ran out, got into the car, started the car, was going to drive away. The husband came running and he put his hand through the window to try and grab the keys, but she pressed the button and the window went up and jammed his hand. And she dragged him for seven miles and he died. That's the situation because of the fall. So Paul is saying that just like the law has dominion over you till you die, your husband rules over you till you die. But in this illustration, the woman has found another man, a wonderful man. And she wants to marry him, but she can't marry him until her husband dies. Because the law of marriage is when one of you die, the marriage is annulled. Until death do us part. That's what is a, even in our modern marriage vows, we, we say that. So now the wife wants to get rid of the husband so she can marry the second man legally. So she puts arsenic in his orange juice and he drinks it. Does he die? Now some of you will say yes. No, no, please look at the illustration. Who is the husband? Who does he represent? The law. And we are told by Christ himself, till heaven and earth pass away, the law will never die. So the law is indestructible. The law cannot die. There are some who would like to get rid of the law by nailing it on the cross. You won't find that in scripture. So the woman cannot solve the problem. And if she marries the second man, she's committing adultery according to the law. And she's in trouble. So what's the solution? But let's now look at the situation. Why does she want to get rid of her first husband? Is her first husband, which represents the law, a bad guy? Well, look at verse 12 of Romans 7. Therefore the law is holy and the 
commandment, holy and just and good. So if her husband is good, why does she want to get rid of this marriage? Well, here's the reason. She and her husband are incompatible. Yes, he's holy, he's righteous, he's just. But she is a sinner, slave as a, sold as a slave to sin. So he asked her to, to cook her some spaghetti, she burns it. He asked her to wash the dishes, she breaks it. She's incapable of doing what the law is demanding. That's the problem with the first marriage. But there is a problem with the husband also. Two problems. Number one problem is the husband is not able to sympathize with her weakness. She comes to him and says, Husband, I want to do exactly what you say, but I'm incapable. And he says, I don't care whether you're weak or strong. You better do as I tell you or you die. And number two problem, the husband is incapable of helping her to do what he's asking her to do. He says, wash the dishes. And she says, husband, can you help me? My hands are weak. And he says, my job is commanding, not helping. See, that's the problem with the law. It cannot sympathize with our weakness and it cannot help us to do what he's asking us to do. The other man is wonderful because he can sympathize with our weakness because he was tempted in all points like we are, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 4.15, and number two, he can help us to do what he's asking us. And what he's asking us to do is the same as the law is asking us to do. But the difference is that he can come to our aid. Hebrews 2 verse 18. But she can't marry him until her husband dies. And he refuses to die. So what's the solution? Ah, the second man comes to her and says to her, the only way you can marry me is for you to die. But she says, if I die... How can I marry you? Ah, he says, I'm not asking you to commit suicide. That's not the solution. Let me take you unto myself, put you to death, put to an end the life that is married to the law, and then I will raise you with my life and the two of us will become one. And I will sympathize with your struggles and I will help you to live the holy life that you could not live under the law. Now please notice verse 4. Who dies? Not the husband, not the law. That is the mistake those Christians make who say that the law was nailed on the cross. Look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you, not the law, and brethren, you, you Christians. Of course, this time he's referring to the Jews of Rome. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. And as we saw, you know, when we did Romans 5, that the death of Christ was a corporate death. It was not one man dying instead of all men. It is all men who died in that one man. 2 Corinthians 5.14 When one died, all died. So you died to the law with the, on the cross of Christ. And he raised you with a new life. So look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another. You may be united to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Holy living is the result of our union with Christ. You remember what Jesus said? Abide in me and you, I in you. Without me, you can do nothing. You abide in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit and my Father will be pleased. Folks, this is the gospel. The Jews of Rome had failed. They were still upholding to the law as a means a method of salvation. Now verse 5 of Romans 7. For when we were in the flesh, that's before we became Christians, before we surrendered the flesh to the cross of Christ, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Do you know we have a sinful nature that not only is incapable of keeping the law, we have a sinful nature that is anti-law. And Paul will bring this out in Romans 8 verse 7. The carnal mind, that is the mind controlled by the flesh, because the word carnal is fleshly. The carnal mind is enmity with God, is not subject to the law of God, can never be. That is our situation, apart from our relationship to Christ. 
So Paul is saying, before your conversion, all you could prove is two things, sinful acts and self-righteousness, which are condemned both by the law because your self-righteousness is motivated by self, which is sin in God's eyes. Now look at verse 6. But now, that is, since you have become a Christian, but now, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. Please notice, as long as you are unconverted, as long as you are under the law, the law will say to you, every time you fall, you must die. That's horrible. But the moment you identify yourself with the death of Christ, which is unto sin, remember, it said, you know, in Romans 6, verse 10, Christ died to sin, and verse 11, we who are baptized into Christ have died to sin. The moment you have surrendered your sinful, condemned life, which in the New, Old, New Testament is called bios, the moment you surrender this bios life to the cross of Christ, the law has no longer dominion over you. And Paul brought that out in Romans 6.14. In fact, it is that statement that got these Jews to turn against Paul. Because Paul said that in Romans 6.14 that sin shall not have dominion, authority over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So, but now, verse 6 of Romans 7, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, under the law, we were trying to serve the law only in terms of letter, do's and don'ts. The Jews bombarded their people. The Pharisees bombarded their people with do's and don'ts. You can't do this, you can't do that. And today, many Christians come under the same system. You better do this, otherwise Christ will not take you to heaven. Under Christ, under grace, you no longer serve out of fear because you did these things out of fear of punishment or desire for reward, which is worthless. When you become a Christian and realize what it costs Jesus to forgive you, to redeem you, to declare you righteous, you want to say, for me to live is Christ. You are now serving God. You're keeping the law, not in the letter, but in the spirit. The spirit of the law is love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, let's go to verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? You see, in Romans 6, if you read Romans 6, especially the last half, you will discover that through Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from under sin. Especially verse 18 onwards. Now in Romans 7, Paul is saying, we have been delivered from under the law. And he may be giving the impression that the law and sin are partners or synonymous. So he's asking the question, is the law sin? And the answer is certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Before Paul was converted, he was a typical Jew. The Jews define sin only in terms of behavior, the do's and don'ts. Christ tried to correct this problem. He said to the Jews, especially to the Pharisees, you claim that you have not murdered anybody, but I say to you, if you hate somebody without a cause, you have already murdered them. And if you look at a woman to last, even though you don't commit the act, you have already committed adultery in the eyes of God's law in the eyes of God. When you realize that, when you realize that the law does not only demand perfect behavior, perfect action, it demands perfect desires, perfect motives. You will say, who can be saved under the law? And Christ will say, with man it is impossible. With God all things are possible. Okay, now, Paul discovered after his conversion that the law demands not only perfect actions, but perfect desires. So let us see now what Paul says in verse 8, 9, and 10, and so on. But sin, verse 8 of chapter 7, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires. For apart from the law, sin was dead. In other words, 
we have a nature that is anti-sin. And I did not know it was wrong to desire wrong things. Human laws don't de deal with desires. They deal only with actions, with behavior. But God's law demands perfect desires. And we have a nature that is anti-law. That is our nature. Let me give you an experience. When I was president of our college in Uganda, we received a lump sum of money from America, from the members of America, so that we could buy a brand new Mercy Ferguson tractor. We had a farm two miles from our college. The problem with the old tractor was that the students who worked in the farm would sit, jump on the tractor because they didn't want to walk two miles to do their work. And the, the tractor was damaged. Now we have a brand new tractor. And I, as the president, passed a law. It was supported by the board of members of the college. Any student found sitting on this tractor, except the driver, especially on the fenders, will be charged 10 shillings, about 50 US cents, for doing that. Three days after the rule was made, after it was announced to the students, a student was found sitting on the fender. And the problem was, he was not even a farm worker. So he was brought to my office. And I said, why did you sit on the fender? And you know what he said? Because you made the rule. That's human nature. I said, fine, no problem. I took a piece of paper and I put a note. Please charge this student, mentioning his name, 10 shillings. And I said, please take this to the treasurer. And he looked at it and he said, please, pastor, I'm a poor student. I can't afford 10 shillings. I said, you should have thought of that when you did what you did. And you know what he said to me? The devil made me do that. I said, no, no, the devil did not make you do that. Your sinful nature, that is anti-rules and anti-law, made you do that. But pastor, can't you forgive me? I said, if I forgive you, I will be breaking the rule myself. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I put my hand in my pocket, removed 10 shillings, and gave it to him. He said, please go and pay the fine. You know, we became friends. And today, he's a pastor. <laughs> How to win friends and influence people. So please remember that what Paul is saying, that early after my conversion, I discovered that the law's demand of God, the law of God demands not only perfect behavior, not only perfect action, but perfect desires, perfect motives. And so in verse 9, he says, I was alive once without the law. That is, as a Pharisee, I had not understood the full demands of the law. I kept the rules of my Judaism and I thought heaven was mine. If you read Philippians 2 verse 6, he says, as a Pharisee, I was blameless when it came to the keeping of the law. But now he discovered that he was been breaking the law all along. So he says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, when I realized what the law was demanding, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was, was to bring life. That's how he was raised as, as a Jew. You want to go to heaven? Better keep the commandments of God, the Torah. And I did my best. And I was pretty good. But now I discovered that the commandment which was supposed to give me eternal life, I found to bring death. For sin, not the law, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Sin, folks, is a deceiver. <coughs> it comes to you and says, you know, you're not that bad. You can make some contribution. <coughs> Pardon me. You can make some contribution towards your salvation. So the problem is not the law. The problem is sin, our nature and what it is. Now, therefore, verse 12, what I read already, the law is holy. And the commandment, holy, just, and good. The problem is not the law. The problem is us. Now verse 13 onward. Has that then what is good become death to me? Is the law to blame for my death? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin has produced, is producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment Listen to this. Sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. 
Have you realized how exceedingly sinful you are? If you haven't, then the devil will trap you in Galatianism, that you can make some contribution towards your salvation. Now, verse 14 to 21, the difficult passage. Is Paul talking about himself before conversion or after conversion? That's the wrong question. To understand verse 14 to 21, I need to read to you a fundamental principle that Paul used in his ministry. And that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So keep your finger at Romans 7 and we'll turn to chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. And here is a principle that we should apply even today in our witnessing. It's a fundamental principle of witnessing. Chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read verse 19 to 22. For though I am free from all men, I am not under any man, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. There are people who oppose me. I'm not under them, but I don't fight them, hoping that one day they will see the light. Verse 20, And to the Jews I became as a Jew. He put himself in the shoes of the Jews. That was no problem for him because he was a Jew himself. When I worked in Africa, I had to understand how Africans thought. I had to put myself in their shoes in order to understand their gospel, in order to present the gospel. For example, when an African said to me, this is my brother, I thought, same father, same mother. No, no, no. In African culture, when he says, this is my brother, he's saying he belongs to the same tribe as I do. They are very strong on biblical, on the idea of solidarity. And I could, I could use that to explain to them the two Adams, which we did in chapter 5 of Romans. So what Paul is saying, that when I preach to the Jews, I put myself in their shoes, that I might win Jews to those who are under the law, the legalists, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, which the Jews that he was talking to in Romans 7 were. Verse 21, to those who are without law, as without law, but not being without law towards God, but under law towards God, towards Christ rather that I might win those who are without law. Now listen to verse 22. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So when I worked in Africa, I had to put myself in their shoes to find out how they thought, what was their culture, their mindset, to help them. When I came to America, I had to think like an American. It's very difficult because I come from an Indian culture that is not American. So I had to put myself in their shoes. This is the fifth principle. That is the principle Paul is using in Romans 7, verse 14 to the end. So when he uses the word I 21 times in this passage, Romans 7, 14 to 21, he's putting himself pardon me, in the shoes of those Asian Jews who were still under the law. And this is what he says. Now he knows from experience what he's saying is true. Chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, fleshly, sold under sin. The law is good, it is holy. But we are the problem. We are sinners by nature. We are slaves to sin. And here's the problem. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will or choose to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Is that your experience? Are you doing what you hate to do? Did you promise God to be good when you were baptized? Do you promise God to be good every new year? Are you keeping it? This is the experience. Verse 16, if then I do what I will or choose not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. In other words, my problem is not my will. My problem is my behavior, which is the flesh causing it. Verse 17, but now, if it, sorry, now, but now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Please notice the word sin is singular. It's not referring to the verb but to the noun by nature 
In other words, I have become a Christian. I want to do good. I choose to do the right thing. But my flesh won't allow it. Therefore, it is not my converted mind that is the problem. It is my sinful nature that is in my members that is the problem. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my sinful nature, nothing good dwells. Have you come to that conclusion? Nothing good dwells. For to will or choose is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. You know, one day, one of the leading brethren of my church showed me a letter from a lady who had worked for our denomination for 50 long years, very famous woman. She's now living in California, and she wrote this letter. She's now 90 years old, and she showed me the letter in a scribbly handwriting. This is what she wrote. The reason I'm not dead is because I'm afraid to die. Here is she working for God, serving the church for 50 long years. She's afraid to die. But then I read your article on Christ our righteousness and justification by faith. And for the first time, I have found peace. So before I die, I want to thank you for that article that you wrote. That is not a unique experience. There are thousands of Christians who are living in darkness, in insecurity, like this woman. So what Paul is saying in verse 18, that in me, in my nature, sinful nature, the flesh, nothing good dwells. Verse 19, for the good that I will choose to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do that I practice. In other words, my behavior is contradicting what I really want to do in my converted mind. Verse 20, now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And I have news for you. That sinful nature that's causing the problem in your life will not make it to heaven. Flesh and blood will not go to heaven. That sinful flesh. You will be given a new nature when Christ comes. Until then, that nature will bug you, will be your greatest enemy. So even though you leave the cities and the bad places and go out into the mountains, you're taking your sinful nature with you. Today, they have discovered during the monastic period, when the monks left the towns and the cities and built their monasteries in the tops of the mountains, away from the world, they discovered that these monks were practicing all kinds of terrible things. Just like we are discovering some Catholic priests doing what they are doing to young boys and girls. Don't blame them. It's their nature. The gospel is only the solution. So Paul is saying that it is no longer I, my converted mind, but sin that dwells in me. Now look at verse 21 of Romans 7. I find then a law, a principle, a force, that evil is present with me, the one who wills or chooses to do good. That's the battle of the Christian life. And you Jews at Rome, you know this. Be honest with yourself. Now verse 22. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. These Jews delighted in the law of God. Now what did he mean by inward man? That is a phrase, inward or inner man, that Paul used always in his writing to the converted mind. So his mind was converted. His mind experienced repentance. But his flesh was sinful and will remain sinful to his dying day. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh will always remain flesh. So the trouble is, is that his mind is in harmony with God's law. He delights in the law of God according to the inward man. But, verse 23, I see another law, another force in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now I want to illustrate this. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm holding the Bible. The law of gravity is pulling the Bible down. Why is it not falling down? Because I'm holding it up, and what power am I using? Muscle power. Now, let me make it clear. Is muscle power a law, a constant force? And the answer is no. It is strong sometimes, it is weak. And if I hold the Bible for a long time, the muscles will get weaker and weaker and the law of gravity will win. Every time you fly in an airplane, the aircraft is defying 
not conquering, defying the law of gravity. Let the gas in that aeroplane run out and the law of gravity will take over. So please remember, we can defy the law of sin. And if you have strong wills, you have more success than those who have weak will. But it doesn't matter. Ultimately, the law of sin will win. And that's what Paul is saying in verse 22 and 23. And then he cries out in agony, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm a slave to sin. Who will deliver me? And his immediate answer is, I thank God through Jesus Christ. And he ends up chapter 7 with the situation he's been describing. So then, with the mind, the converted mind, I myself serve the law of God. So my mind is in perfect harmony with the law of God. But with the flesh, I'm serving the law of sin. That is our problem, folks. That is why Romans 7 is important. To destroy all confidence in the self. What Paul is saying to the Jews of, of Rome is not unique to them. We have the same problem today. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live. The law of sin in your members is far more stronger than your converted mind. And it will bring your mind into captivity and make you do what you really in your heart do not want to do. Now please remember, there is a solution to this problem. The solution is in chapter 8 of Romans, which is our next study. And in that study, you will discover that there is a force that you can receive from God when you accept Christ that is greater than the law of sin. But that's for the next study. Until then, may Romans 7 open your eyes that from head to foot you are a sinner, that you can make no contribution towards your salvation. Your only hope is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that is my prayer for you folks in Jesus' name.